Oh, Billy Connolly, you cracked me up. <laughs> oh, hello. I didn't see you there. My name is Craig McKenzie. And over the next few nights, I'm going to be reading to you some chapters from one of my favourite books of all time. No, it's not Billy Connolly's autobiography. Although I just now realise I was holding it upside down. <clears throat> this is Measle and the Rathmonk by Ian Ogilvy and illustrated by Chris Mould and printed by Oxford University Press. It's about a small boy and his evil wizard uncle, or rather, Rathmonk uncle, but you'll find out what that means as we go on. So are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then I'll begin. A Horrible House, Chapter One. Measle Stubbs was ten and a half years old. He was small, thin and bony. Most of the time, he was as hungry as a very hungry horse. He had a short, snub nose, high cheekbones, a pair of eyes coloured a deep emerald green and when he felt like it, a wide and friendly smile. His hair was brown and stood up all over his head in spiky tufts. It was the oddest haircut, long where it should have been short and short where it should have been long. And the reason it was like this was because Measle cut his hair himself using a blunt and rusty kitchen knife, with which he sawed and hacked at his hair whenever it got so long that it fell into his eyes. Apart from being the most uneven haircut imaginable, it also hadn't been washed in a very long time. Neither had his clothes, and sometimes he smelt pretty bad. Particularly when the weather was warm. It wasn't warm very often where Miso Stubbs lived. Miso Stubbs lived in a cold and horrible house. It was not Miso's choice to live there, it was circumstances. The horrible house was at the far end of a dreary, dirty street full of dirty, dreary houses. But three things set this house apart from all the others. The first was the way that it looked. All black with a tall, pointed roof. Tall, dark, narrow windows like blind eyes and tall, suit-caked chimneys that looked like dirty fingers pointing at the sky. Other houses in the street just looked dingy and dreary, but Measle's house looked as if something bad had happened in it, and quite possibly something bad could happen there again tomorrow. The second fact that made it different from the other houses in the street was that it was the only one that was occupied. All the other houses had been deserted by their owners a long time ago, and their doors and windows boarded over. If you stood at the far end of the street and looked down its length, you'd have thought that every house there was abandoned and derelict. But if you looked a little harder, you might have seen, down at the far end of the street, a faint glimmer of light from an attic window, which was the only indication that there was anybody living in this street at all. The third fact that made this house different from all the others was also the strangest. All day and all night, winter, summer, autumn and spring, there was a small black cloud that hung, never moving, over the dismal roof, dribbling a steady, constant stream of rain that fell only on the house where Measle Stubb lived, and not at all on any of the others in the street. The house belonged to Basil Tramplebone, and Basil Tramplebone was Measle Stubbs's legal guardian. Measle lived in the house with just his legal guardian for company, and his legal guardian wasn't good company at all. In fact, his legal guardian hardly spoke because he hated everybody. But that was all right because everybody who had ever met him hated Basil Tramplebone. He was very tall and thin, and he always wore black clothes. A black coat and a black shirt and a black tie, black trousers and black shoes and black boots and black socks. His greasy hair was black and he parted it in the middle and plastered it down on his head with black shoe polish. The only things that weren't black about him were his face and his hands. 
Basil's face was very white, as though all the blood had been drained out and replaced with milk. His eyes were like fish eyes, staring and blank and very, very cold. His long bony hands were the colour of candles and the skin was so dry that it rustled when he rubbed his palms together, which he did when he was pleased. Basil Tramplebone wasn't pleased very often, so the rustling noise didn't happen very often either. If the outside of Basil Tramplebone's house was grim and gloomy and depressingly ugly, the inside was even worse. It was so ghastly that Measel only dared go into three rooms, the kitchen, the bathroom and the attic. All the rooms in the house smelt bad, each one in a different way, but at least being in the kitchen and the bathroom and the attic didn't frighten him half to death. He certainly didn't dare go into the room that was supposed to be his bedroom. There was a huge black oak wardrobe in there full of clothes that weren't his. They felt damp and smelt of mildew. Once, Measle had got up enough courage to sort through the clothes. He stopped doing that when he found the jacket. It was made of some sort of rough material, and it had three sleeves. Two in the usual places, and a third that stuck out the back. When he finally got up the courage to ask Basil about it, Basil told him to mind his own business. But if he must know, then all the clothes in the wardrobe had been there over the years by visiting friends of his, some of whom were perhaps a little different. The wardrobe was in one dark corner of the room and a great black bed that looked like a coffin was in the other. There were black velvet curtains over the windows and the glass in the windows was painted black so you couldn't even see out at all. And what with the black painted walls and ceiling and floorboards, it was one of the gloomiest rooms you can imagine and one that would certainly give you nightmares if you tried to sleep in it. So Measle didn't try at all. Instead, he slept on a pile of old rags in the kitchen, right up by the ancient iron stove, which was the only place in that dreadful house that was warm. Measle hated Basil Tramplebone, and of course, Basil Tramplebone hated Measle, because Basil Tramplebone hated everybody. He only looked after Measel because Measel's mother and father had been killed by an encounter with a deadly snake when Measel was four years old, leaving poor little Measel an orphan. The story about the deadly snake had come from Basil, who, in Measel's experience, had always told the truth. But in this case, Measel wasn't too sure. Perhaps because he badly wanted his parents to be alive. So deep in his heart, Measel was certain that his mother and father were still around somewhere and that one day they would come back to him. Meanwhile, his parents had left a lot of money in the bank and now it was all Measles. But a judge had said that Measel was too young to have control of all that money and too young to live by himself and had appointed Basil, who said he was Measel Stubbs's fourth cousin twelve times removed and therefore Measel's closest living relative, to look after him and his money. The odd thing was, although Measle had been too young to remember this now, the judge had looked a little like Basil. The same black clothes, the same cold fishy eyes, the same white, white face. He even talked a bit like Basil too. And every time he looked at Basil, he smiled like a crocodile. As if he was approving of everything that Basil said. Of the three rooms that Measle could bear to be in, the attic was his favourite. The bathroom smelt bad, and the water that came out of the taps was brown and with green floating bits in it, so Measle didn't bath very often. At least there was a window in the bathroom, and sometimes Measle would stand on the cracked lavatory seat and look out over the window and at the dismal railway yards that were beyond the house and dream of living somewhere else. The kitchen was warm and dry, but it smelt of rotten cabbages and was infested with enormous cockroaches. Some of them were so big that when Measle stepped on them they didn't go crunch under his foot like the smaller ones did. They simply wriggled about in a disgusting way until Measle took his foot off them and then they scuttled away under the stove quite unharmed. As far as the attic was concerned Measle had only recently discovered it because Basil had never allowed him to go up there before. 
Something interesting had certainly been going on up that narrow flight of stairs, because Basil spent many hours in the attic, and for a long time, Maisel used to stand at the bottom of the stairs and listen, and occasionally he'd heard sounds that he couldn't explain to himself. And then, one day, about six months earlier, Basil had said, Come with me, Maisel. And then he'd led the way up the cramped, steep staircase and into the extraordinary attic room, and Maisel's jaw had dropped in amazement at what he saw. It was the biggest, and probably the best, miniature railway set in the world. From that moment, the attic became the one room in the house that Maisel actually didn't mind spending time in. It was still a scary room. There was something in there that lived up in the rafters. Maisel had seen movement up there among the dark beams of the wood and once a pair of red glowing eyes. What the something was, Maisel really didn't know, just so long as the something stayed up there and out of sight and never put in an appearance. At least there were no cockroaches in the attic. In fact, there were no insects of any kind up there, which was odd, because the rest of the house was crawling with them. Maisel was fascinated by the train set. Somehow, Basil Tramplebone had managed to build a miniature version of the dismal railway yards on a huge table, right in the middle of the attic. The table was so big that there was only a narrow gap all the way around between the edge of the table and the attic walls. And it was a good thing that both Measle and Basil were so thin, otherwise they could never have fitted in the narrow space. Everything on the enormous table was accurate, down to the smallest detail. The coal yard had a mound of tiny chips of real coal. The street lights shone with a sickly yellow light and there was a constant tiny stream of dirty water flowing in the miniature gutters. But further out, away from the town, Basil had changed the look. Instead of rows and rows of cheap sooty houses, which Maisel could see beyond the railway lines if he looked out the bathroom window, Basil had created a forest of tall pines, with the trees set so close together it was hard to see between them. It was very dark and gloomy, with strange little houses here and there, and clearings in the woods. The houses were quite different from the grimy houses round the railway yards. They were made of little logs with stone chimneys and porches on the front, and Measle decided that if he was an inhabitant of that place, he'd much rather live in one of them than in the depressing town. When Basil played with his train set, and if he was in a good mood, he would let Maisel come up to the attic to watch. From the very start of being allowed to watch Basil play with his trains, it was obvious to Maisel that Basil didn't care for anything modern. There were no electric commuter trains, no long-distance diesel trains. Everything about the set was old-fashioned, and all the locomotives were steam engines from an age gone past. There were two sorts of trains, passenger trains and freight trains, and each one was detailed to the smallest degree. When Maisel sat in a chair and watched, he would stay very quiet and still, because Basil Tramplebone hated noise and fidgeting. And he would look down at the layout, and every time he did so, he saw something new in the scenery. And that's what he liked best about coming up to the attic and watching Basil play with his trains. One day he saw that Basil had made a little plume of smoke to come out of the chimneys of one of the cabins in the woods. Another time, Basil had built a water tower by the side of the tracks, and when one of the freight trains stopped underneath it, the tower let out a tiny trickle of water that filled the boiler of the engine. Once, Maisel had noticed that Basil had added a lake in the middle of the forest, not with real water this time, which was a disappointment, but with a mirror embedded in the surface, surrounded by little pine trees. It looked very realistic enough, and the way the mirror reflected the dark pine trees and the rocks of the shoreline was probably more effective than if the lake had been made with real water. Maisel had to admit that Basil was good with his hands. It seemed as though Basil could make just about anything, so long as the thing was very small. Sometimes Maisel was amazed at the details of all the scaled down objects. Every window in the houses looked like real glass. Every leaf on the trees looked as if it would certainly drop off when autumn came round, and every worn paving stone on the dirty pavements looked as if it had been trodden on by countless shuffling feet. There were quite a few people in the model too. The painted plastic figures were positioned about the train set, doing all the things that people usually do. Shopping, gossiping on street corners, standing on station platforms and waiting for trains. 
There were a few small animals as well. A little black and white dog sniffing around a lamppost, a cat lounging on a windowsill, and deep in the forest, a family of three black bears walking in a line near the lake. And there's the... Uh, you see the train set? It's pretty cool, eh? When Basil Trampobone played with his trains, he always ate a whole box of glazed donuts and drank a gallon of pink lemonade out of a plastic jug. And some of the crumbs and some of the sugar and an occasional drop of lemonade would fall onto the tabletop. He kept the box and the jug close by his side. Measle never got a donut or a glass of lemonade because Basil never offered him any and Measle didn't dare ask. Measle would stare at the crumbs, hoping that Basil would perhaps want to go to the lavatory, and then, while he was gone, Measle could sneak over and lick his finger and dab up the crumbs and the sugar and eat them. But Basil never seemed to go to the lavatory at all, even after eating a whole box of glazed donuts and drinking a gallon of pink lemonade, so Measle never got the chance. Measle Stubbs missed his mother and father badly. He couldn't remember what they looked like because their unfortunate encounter with the snake... Had happened when he was very young. But, all the same, he wished it was them who were here looking after him and not Basil Trampobone. Basil Trampobone didn't like looking after anything other or anybody apart from himself and his train set, of course. He looked after himself and his train set very well indeed. He fed himself the best steaks and gave Measle the fat from around the edges. He always made chips for himself but plain boiled potatoes for Measle and sometimes they weren't cooked all the way and were hard in the middle. Basil Trampobone's black socks were made of silk, and so were his black boxer shorts. Measle didn't have any socks and only two pairs of underpants, and the elastic had stopped working in both of them. But it was the train set that Basil cared for the most, and he spent hours and hours and hours working on it, and tons and tons and tons of Measle's money on the most expensive equipment he could buy. Miso didn't mind so much about the money spent on the train set because the train set was probably the best in the world and he liked looking at it. On the other hand, he didn't like Basil spending all that money on silk shocks and silk boxer shorts when all he had were two pairs of underpants with broken elastic. And he certainly didn't like Basil buying the best steak and chips with Stubbs' money and then not letting him have any. Miso thought that was totally unfair. One night, while he lay curled tight up against the stove, an idea came to him. He hadn't been able to get to sleep because the cockroaches were having a party, or what sounded like a party of cockroaches had them, under the stove. There was a lot of clicking and rustling and tap-tap-tapping of cockroach feet, and he couldn't sleep with all that noise going on. So he decided to think instead. That was when the idea came to him. It was a brilliant idea. It was, he admitted to himself, also a dangerous idea. But the best ideas often are. And Maisel was prepared to take the risk. The next day, at lunch, Basil was having fried sausages and bacon and chips and ketchup. Maisel was having a piece of stale bread and a paper cup of water. Maisel said, Um, Mr Trampbone, sir, the bank called this morning. They want to see you. The bank? Said Basil. He stared at Measle with his fish eyes. When? Well, you were still asleep, sir, said Measle, who was good at lying. Something about some extra money. Money? Yes. It to us, of course. They want to see you about it. The man said something about investing it. Mm. Investing it. Basil always hissed like a rattlesnake whenever he said the letter S. Yes, Mr. Trampelbone. He said it was much. It was too much to leave in an ordinary bank account. Too much. Yes. I should telephone them. Uh, yes, sir, but the the trouble is, is that the telephone doesn't seem to be working anymore, sir. Not working? No, sir. The reason the telephone wasn't working anymore was because Measle had taken the plug out of the socket. He watched nervously as Basil tried the phone. Basil listened to the earpiece for a moment and then hissed like a snake. 
What a nuisance. He put the receiver down and he put on his long black coat and picked up his long black umbrella which looked like a sleeping vampire bat. I'm going out, Beazel, he hissed. To the bank. Behave yourself. Do nothing. Nothing at all. Basil hardly ever went out. He had all their food delivered from the local supermarket and bought all his clothes and stuff for the train set from catalogues, so he never needed to leave the house at all. In fact, when the door closed behind him, Maisel realised that this was the first time he could remember ever being alone in the house, and for a moment he felt scared. Then he said to himself, What can a house do to you? It's not like it's a burglar or a murderer or a mugger or anything like that, so what could it possibly do to you? That made him feel a little better, but not a lot. He looked through a crack in the front door and watched Basil stride down the path of the street. A small piece of the black cow that hung over the house detached itself and began to follow Basil. It dribbled a little shower of rain on Basil's open umbrella. At the end of the path, Basil turned right, which was way to the better part of town where the bank was. Basil was going to have to walk the whole way because he didn't have a car and there were no buses that came to his side of the railway tracks. The bank was about a mile and a half away, which meant that Basil was going to have to walk three miles. And even with his long spider legs, it was going to make some time. It was enough time, Measel thought. More than enough time. And there's Basil on his way to the bank. Doesn't he look like a sordid fellow? So I hope you enjoyed this first chapter. Be sure to listen in to the second chapter, The Train Set. This is where things start to get really good. I hope you enjoyed this first chapter so far, and thank you very much for your time. Good night.